Welcome to the Rehabilitation Studies Speaker Series. The event will begin shortly. Thank you for joining us for this week's presentation. If you'd like to learn more about applying for the Rehabilitation Counseling Education Master's Program or the Rehabilitation and Addiction Counseling Master's Program at St. Cloud State University, please email rce at stcloudstate.edu. Applications are currently being accepted for the fall 2021 term. If you would like to watch the recorded version of this presentation or prior presentations, please visit our YouTube channel by searching for St. Cloud State University Rehabilitation Studies on YouTube. Judy Human, and as you can imagine, for those of you who know that um, Crip Camp was up for an Oscar, it has been really difficult trying to schedule her. So we um, we did a pre-recording, which I'm going to play now, and then there are um, um, a few things that we'll show at the end and talk about next week, our last session. So I'll go ahead and start that video now. Uh, welcome to the Rehabilitation Studies Speaker Series event at St. Cloud State University. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. 
Uh, first, if uh, you would like to receive CRC, CEU credits, uh, you will be sent a short quiz after paying the session fee and attending the webinar. Uh, once the series is complete, uh, we will issue your CEU certificate. Um, the speaker sessions each week are recorded and available for free on our YouTube page. And we will continue to allow people to gain CEU credits by watching the recordings. Uh, next, I'd uh, like for us to go around and introduce ourselves and include a short audio description. And I'll start with myself. Uh, my name is Joanna Christensen, and I am a graduate student at St. Cloud State in uh, the Rehabilitation Counseling Program. I am fair-skinned. I have long brown curly hair, and I'm wearing a grayish purple shirt. And in my background, I'm sitting next to my window, and I've got some art hanging on the wall. So. Uh, Tim, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Joanna. Uh, my name is Tim Alberts. I am also a uh, graduate student at St. Cloud State University in the uh, Rehabil Rehabilitation Counseling Program. Um, I'm an adult male. I have short brown hair, and I am wearing a uh, dark blue long sleeve crew neck shirt. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. It is truly an honor to have Judy Human with us. Judy, can you please introduce yourself and include an audio description? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm on an iPad, so I may not be looking right. Um, I am a 73-year-old white disabled woman using a motorized wheelchair. You can see I can move around. that uh, I am wearing. Um, I have brown hair, which you probably could use a wash. And it's like below my ears. I'm wearing purple and teal earrings. And I have on a kind of a burnt orange shirt. And you can't unfortunately see. Um, it was done, um, made by a man named Arthur who has a podcast. And there's a number of um, designs of him on the t-shirt. Sorry, I can't share it. I'm in a hotel room, so it's kind of boring. White background with um, some brown wood around it. And I'm in LA because I'm going to the Oscars on Sunday. Today is Friday. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Judy. Thank you, Joanna. Um, Judy, I'd mentioned that you're, you're going to the Oscars. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about Crip Camp to start our conversation. Um, I, I can only imagine how excited you were to find out that you were being nominated for an Oscar. But I also understand that there are two other films that were nominated that are about people with disabilities. Uh, the Sound of Metal was nominated for Best Picture and Feeling Through was nominated under the category of Best Short Film. Um, can you share with us your thoughts on what it means for you to see that there are three films being nominated and what that impact might be for the disability community. Well, obviously I'm glad that there are three films that have made it to this point. And um, I think it does speak to the fact that disability is moving forward within the industry albeit nowhere where it needs to be yet. So this is a good year and we'll see what goes on in the future. Um, Crib Camp obviously is a film I know best and um, I feel really proud about the work that Jimmy Lebrecht and Nicole Noonan and Sarah Boulder have done in putting the film together and obviously the support of the Obama's Higher Ground production company and Netflix. So I think um, we won the film last night, Thursday, won the Spirit Awards for Best Documentary. I don't know yet uh, what's gonna happen on Sunday, whether or not we'll win the Oscar, but quite frankly, uh, win or lose, we've won because we're in the top five. 
And so um, I know that there are millions of people who have seen the film around the world. And um, I have an op-ed in uh, USA Today, um, today, <laughs> which really is speaking about why I believe the film is really helping to continue to make a difference um, in the visibility of uh, disability related issues in the United States and more broadly. Great, thank you. So um, in, the, in your documentary, uh, Crip Camp, uh, we know that Camp Jeanette had a big impact on your life. Um, can you tell us uh, what that experience meant to you and uh, also to the broader disability community? So one of the things that is very important about Crip Camp is that this little group in Hunter that had just started uh, doing work with video cameras, brought these video cameras to camp and uh, had, you know, came to the camp and said, uh, would you be willing to let us bring the video cameras on the ground and train some kids in how to use it. So that to me is really uh, a very important uh, issue regarding documenting uh, things that are happening. I've been to another camp before, Camp Oakhurst, when I was younger and I loved Camp Oakhurst. And I was like nine until like 12. And I had similar experiences. However, it was a three week camp and um, I was younger. So one of the unique things about Jeanette is it was an older group of disabled teenagers. And there were other, <laughs> excuse me, there were other camps in New York and around the country where older disabled people went also. And I think the things that we experienced at Jeanette are probably similar to what kids in the 13 to 16, 17 year old age bracket experience. And that was basically, you know, the ability to come together for four to eight weeks and um, with friends because kids came back frequently more than one year. And it also enabled us as we were maturing and you know, getting older and needing to be thinking about what non-disabled children were thinking about at that period, which is, okay, we're in high school. What are we gonna be doing next? Who are we talking to? Do we have role models out there, disabled adults who have disabilities that look like ours? What kinds of jobs are they in? Who's gonna support us you know, getting through school, et cetera? Um, and it also was an opportunity for us to really not only look at the barriers that we were experiencing and anticipated that we would continue to experience, um, but it was an opportunity for us to also begin to recognize that we had to take responsibility for helping to address barriers, problems, discrimination. And so that was really a part of what was going on over the years, uh, both at camp and back in the community. And then as we were getting older, beginning to actually work on putting change in place. So, you know, at that point in the late 1960s, numbers of universities were beginning to set up disabled students' offices. And students were involved with helping get those offices set up. And a number of people at different universities, the students who were involved had been at camps. Uh, and so it was, you could see that we were kind of stepping up and uh, beginning to put things in place or working to get things in place that would make our experience for those of us who were going to colleges and universities um, easier so that we would be able to uh, take 
and participate more at the school level. Right, but Judy, you've been a lifelong disability rights activist and now you're an author. Um, you just released your memoir, Being Human, and you have another book coming out this summer, Rolling Warriors. Please share with us what we might learn from your writings. Read the book. <laughs> it's, we, it's a memoir. So if you read it, then yes. give me an example of what you learned. Yeah. Um, you know, what I actually what I learned is, is one of the things I really took is you talked about advocacy. And, um, you know, I, I know that I've been working in this field for, for about 20 years. And you talked about the importance of being an advocate. But you stress that it's even more important for us to make sure that individuals with disabilities have the opportunity to advocate for themselves. So for me, that was something that I really found in your, in your writing um, that I took to heart and something that I'm going to continue to use. Yeah, so for me, thank you. Uh, what was important in writing this book, and I was very fortunate to um, work with Kristen Joyner, who co-wrote the book with me, and she's a great writer, and we really um, worked well together over a couple of year period of time as we were putting this together. I wanted this story to be one that people could relate to, um, people could really get an understanding of how my life evolved and um, both the um, barriers that were put in front of me and hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of other people around the world and how we slowly but surely have been checking away at those barriers and to make people understand that it's not easy, but things can be done and vigilance and knowledge and working collaboratively with others is one of the ways that we begin to make change. Well, uh, one of the things that I found um, that you wrote in your book, Judy, um, was a statement uh, describing you it's uh, uh, you're a person who refused to accept what you were told about who you could be, and you were make, you were willing to make a fuss about it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what that statement means to you? I think it ultimately meant that my father, really, and my mother, but my father, I think even more, uh, no was not something that was really accepted. I can't, not just for me and my brothers, but you know, you had to really seriously thinking, think about saying, no, this couldn't be done uh, because you damn well better know that it really couldn't be done or you hadn't, you'd seriously looked, but you um, needed some help on figuring out how to get to yes. I, I think for me, um, one of the, uh, serious issues in the book is my evolution from being a child to an adult and even as an adult you know sometimes it can be really difficult to really um, work towards turning other people's no's into yeses and sometimes it really also requires the support of family and friends to be able to make that happen. And I think it was clear when I was denied my job as a teacher. And at that point, you know, it was clear that the perception of disabled students was rehab would not pay for you to study to be a teacher because you were a wheelchair user, because they would want to know someone with a similar disability who was already teaching and was a wheelchair user. So since we don't know any people like that, tell rehab you wanna be something else because then they'll support that. But you know, know what you wanna do and figure out how to get there, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny actually, because um, this was in the 1960s 
um, a rehab counselor actually had been assigned to our high school. So it was a regular high school that had some special ed classes in it. And so this is before any legislation that required that rehab counselors be involved with transition. And um, so I applied and I took the tests that you needed to take. And I took a battery of psychological tests and uh, they asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, a speech therapist. And the evaluator said that my scores lead more towards my being a social worker. So I should be a social worker. And um, my parents basically said to this guy, she wants to be a speech therapist, she support her to be a speech therapist. But of course, the truth is I wanted to be a teacher. And so I minored in education. And nobody ever asked me, my rehab counselor, none of my professors ever asked me why I was taking uh, classes to teach, which I always find very curious that mm. nobody wanted to know why I was doing that. And um, I, when I was denied my license, you know, when I got the letter that said that I, wasn't granted my license because of paralysis of both lower extremities, sequelae of poliomyelitis. Um, I really wasn't sure what I was gonna do. I mean, I had known all along that that is likely what would happen, but I hadn't uh, anticipated how I would feel when it did happen. And how I felt about it was, um, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna try to sue? I never met a lawyer. I didn't really know what litigating meant at that point when I was 21 years old. And um, it was a scary thought because I thought, oh, what if I actually start teaching and I don't do a good job? Would that mean that no other disabled people who were wheelchair users would get a job as a teacher. And that certainly could be a logical or illogical thought about what might happen. There were no laws at that point. There's no 504, no ADA, no nothing. And I was just very lucky that a lawyer called me because he had seen articles in the New York Times, was writing a book on uh, civil rights and wanted to talk about my experiences. I liked the guy and I asked him if he would represent me. That's how all that happened. So really, you know, a sincere degree of insecurity uh, definitely existed. But once I made that decision to move forward with the lawsuit, I think that really and as there are other examples, a, a turning point in my life where I really recognized that I had to be strong and resilient and um, not be deterred by other people's views, which were not just views about me, but views of the class of disabled people. Judy, um, for our next question, I, I wanted to talk about COVID. And um, I know that this last year has been extremely challenging for everyone, but more so for the disability community. Can you please share what people should understand and know about the impact of COVID on people with disabilities? This is a rehab class, right? Correct. And yeah, Zoom is great, but unfortunately, we can't have a discussion now. I mean, I think... Um, we don't exactly know. Um, we know that a lot of people died. We know that at least 50% of the people died had disabilities. We really don't know the impact that pe of COVID on people who survived. Um, certainly they won't all have a disability, but we have no idea how many will um, or what degree of disability they will have. And I think, you know, as rehab counselors, 
it's going to be interesting to see uh, where this population of people are going to go because they're not all going to be the same as I was saying. It's kind of like polio. You know, people had polio and some people died and some people became quadriplegics with ventilator usage. Other people, there was nothing uh, really that they were affected by, but later on they were affected, like years down the road. And so is it going to be physical? Is it going to be respiratory? Is it going to be a combination? Is it going to be fatigue? What is it going to be? And um, I think it's not, it, it's very much going to require that we are able to know who people are that have had COVID and maybe having lasting effects. And it's also going to mean that agencies like rehab under order of selection on and on um, know what and how to do their jobs. So people who are coming for support are not left dangling um, or feeling that they don't have a disability, which is significant enough. Um, I mean, I understand order of selection. It's basically when you don't have enough money, you know, you pick up people who are the most significantly disabled first. Um, but I think these are issues that we're going to have to really grapple with, not just for people who have COVID, but I think it's an indication of um, how we serve people overall. Great. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us about that. Um, so I'm going to kind of jump to a different um, aspect here um, about the ADA, uh, which was signed into law in on July 26, 1990. Um, we know there's a lot of uh, work to be done in that area of uh, disability advocacy. Um, what changes have you seen over the last 20 years and what hopes do you have for the next 20 years? I mean, I think... The question really needs to be, what do rehab counselors see um, the effect of Title I under the ADA 30 years ago? And are people finding it um, easier to get people jobs? Uh, and I mean, get people jobs, but to help people uh, look into areas of employment they may be interested in and uh, provide the kind of support that people may need to get those jobs. Um, we know that the unemployment rate for disabled people continues to be higher significantly than for non-disabled people. I think it's really relevant to find out from rehab counselors why that is. I mean, why do you feel that um, it's still so difficult for people um, to be getting jobs? And what are the barriers that you see? And are those barriers violations of the ADA, Title I? Um, and if they are, you know, what is your agency doing to help ensure that these issues are addressed through your State Department of Labor or whatever, wherever it would be? But I mean, we have counselors, um, you know, one of your major goals is to help people find employment, get the training and education they need to be able to find a job. One which hopefully they will have, and it's another whole issue, given the amazing changes that have been going on in the world of work over the last 30 years and looking at what is gonna happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years, are people that you're working with actually getting the training that they need to be able to work in the workforce of today? Um, are we really investing in people uh, not to get them in and out of the door as quickly as possible, but to be able to get them the, the knowledge that they need to be able to have sustainable employment? And sustainable employment doesn't necessarily mean with the same company. Um, but it may well mean that they have the skills that they need 
to be able to learn and advance in the fields that they're, they're interested in working in. And I don't know, you know, I mean, for me, you know, I was the assistant secretary at education in the 1990s. Um, and I had rehab RSA was under my purview. The commissioner of rehab reported uh, in that construct um, as did the Office of Special Ed Programs and the National Institute on Disability Rehabilitation Research. And um, I felt, you know, when I was a student, then when I was in that position, that it was really important for rehab counselors to really be up on top of the world of work. Um, I know it's important to understand people's medical conditions to a degree, but to me, it's equally important that counselors see and understand the world of work and can really help people who are first entering the world of work, people who've had employment and then lost their job for whatever, to help them look at prospects for the future, to help people get the kind of training and education that they need. So for me, Title I, um, the employment section under the ADA is, I think, a decent piece of legislation. Um, why the unemployment rate is as high as it is for disabled individuals, even pre-COVID, I think is something that would be very interesting for uh, we have counselors to be able to jump into this game for discussions, uh, to look at, you know, what's working, what's not working. And, you know, I, I feel, I mean, just being honest, um, more disabled people who are getting services from rehab really need to believe that their counselors understand the world of work and um, can really be advocates with them. And um, so those are some of the things that I think are very important. And you know, we have, you know, this much better than I do. Um, it, in my view, we have counselors need to be people of the world. And by that, you know, there are so many components of things that you have to be looking at. Is the person getting benefits if they need them? Um, how do you deal with people transitioning off of benefits into getting a regular job? Um, do they know enough, both the counselor and the client about the various programs that are out there? Um, meaning, you know, ticket to work or other programs. Um, how are the rehab counselor associations really getting involved at the federal and state level with you know, getting additional funding for rehab agencies, producing better outcomes, stronger outcomes, getting people that you've been serving who have been benefiting, speaking up in support of the value of rehab. Um, I think all those things are very important. Um, Julie, we wanted to ask you a, a specific question regarding the ADA, and this is something that just came up recently, and I'm going to read it just to make sure I, I, I give you the correct information. Um, recently, the 11th Circuit Court in Georgia ruled that websites for businesses that are generally open to the public are not places of public accommodation under the ADA. Um, in this particular case, the court ruled that although inaccessibility online can be a significant inconvenience. This particular business cannot be found liable under Title III of the ADA for having a website that is inaccessible. Um, would you share your thoughts with us regarding this ruling? Um, it's very important that everybody vote, that people understand what the US Senate does, who appoints judges, the US Senate, if you look at that ruling and the ruling out of the Ninth Circuit, uh, which is the opposite of what the 11th said, um, the judges were a Bush appointee 
and one or two Trump appointees, um, not like in um, California. So uh, I, obviously I don't agree uh, with uh, the decision out of the 11th circuit. And, um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, we need to have a better understanding of government. You know, if the people don't want those rulings, um, it's not that specific ruling. It's basically, you know, in my view, you know, this case is clearly saying that, well, tough, you know, you're blind, whatever, tough, you know, we don't believe, and it's ridiculous. It's, first of all, it's ridiculous that uh, Target which I think is the company involved. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not giving you a legal analysis clearly. But, you know, why are they arguing this? And that to me, you know, why are we spending money in their stores if they're arguing like this? Yeah, it's just a whole chain of events. And um, we have to, you know, really. I mean, everybody, but people working in this industry need to take off their blinders um, and really need to look at how is your job adversely affected when companies have policies like this. This case may well wind up before the Supreme Court and given the court, who the hell knows what will happen. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I think uh, we're going to take some time here to cover a few questions um, in the chat box here. Um, the first one I see is, uh, is this, can you share your perspective on the Biden administration after the first 100 days related to persons with disabilities? I think today was, no. I don't think we've hit the first 100 days yet, but okay. <laughs> because it came in on January 21st. Yeah. And sure. today is the 23rd. So I think it's another one to two weeks. Um, but my, my feeling is that he, um, I think he's providing strong leadership. I think he's really, disability is definitely a part of his agenda. I think the fact that he, came out as a stutterer himself in the campaign was actually a big deal. And uh, the work that was being done on the campaign during the campaign in the area of disability. And there's some people are being appointed to positions. And, um, you know, I had a political position in the Clinton administration. I didn't start till July. Um, of 93. So there's going to be, over the next number of months, more positions that are going to be filled. And I do believe that there will be more disabled people being hired in some of these positions. Um, you know, I believe that the environment is a very big issue that we need to be concerned about. We need to be concerned about infrastructure. We need to be concerned about more money going into home and community-based services. I think many of the um, areas that the president has been laying out are really important, not only to the average you know, US person, but also particularly for both disabled individuals and um, getting jobs for disabled people in new industries um, or growing industries gets back to a point that I was making earlier, which is uh, do rehab counselors have a better or good enough sense of the employment market in the future? Are we really pushing to get people education? So it's not first job, any job, but education and training so that a first job, either their real first job or their first job after disability is one that will allow them to move forward. Um, what are we doing to ensure that training programs 
are really inclusive of disabled individuals that state you know may be offering through state department of labor or whatever I, I think you know we have this very exciting area um I, I do think that people in the field need to be excited about the prospects of what can happen okay so we have another question here um uh, one of the goals of numerous disability advocacy organizations is uh, focused on the ratification of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, what can we do to help advance this? Um, there's an organization called USID, United States International Council on Disability, USICD. Um, join it, it's cheap to join. Uh, USID is the main group that led uh, work when we attempted to get the CRPD ratified uh, two times in the Obama administration. Um, and I was the special advisor for international disability rights at that time uh, when we were moving the treaty forward. And I would say, um, ultimately, we didn't get the CRPD ratified. And I hate to sound so political, but I'm telling you fact. Uh, every country determines ratification differently. In the United States, a, a treaty, a UN treaty can only be ratified if two thirds of the Senate vote to recommend that the president ratify the treaty. When we started working in 2010 and 11 on uh, bringing the disability community and allies into the discussion on the CRPD, uh, one of the issues was not enough disabled people really understood what the CRPD was. That's an overall issue that the US, unlike many other countries, it has very limited knowledge in what the UN does and the role the UN is playing in many countries and um, the role that um, US citizens need to play to encourage that our US senators, only the Senate, the House does not vote on this, only the Senate, um, that you feel that the CRPD is something that we should ratify. So we had a committee markup uh, in the first term of President Obama. President Obama signed the treaty. Once the treaty is signed, then it went over to the Senate with a package that was an analysis from the State Department and other government agencies on uh, what impact the CRPD would have in the United States. It basically said that we are ADA, 504, IDEA, and other laws uh, put us in pretty good shape. And um, so there was going to be little that we would have to do beyond implementing our laws on a regular basis um, if we ratified the treaty. And we were not able to get 67 senators. We had 100% Democratic support, and we were only able to get five US Republican senators to agree to support the treaty. And um, that to me was a real tragedy because the CRPD really is important for US people in order to travel, study, and work abroad to the extent that we can really get um, the US government to work with, collaborate with, cajole. You know, if, if we are a member of the family of countries that have ratified the CRPD, we can say to country B, um, we encourage you to do more and we're willing to help you 
do more. We would be able to, right now we can't serve on the committee out of Geneva that reviews reports that come in from countries about the progress they're making or lack thereof. We can't run anyone for a committee because we haven't ratified. We can't vote at the annual uh, uh, Conference of State Party meetings because we haven't ratified. And I think it's, uh, it's a real tragedy. Now, whether or not we'll be able to do anything with the Obama administration, Obama, I'm sorry, the Biden administration, Biden is committed to the CRPD. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, we don't have enough Republicans to move this forward. So I would say it's not gonna happen in the next one to two years. Well, the, the last question we have for you, um, and I'll, I'll read it. Um, so in the role as advisor to President Obama on the uh, international disability rights, what are some of your proudest moments serving in this role? So I worked out of the State Department. I worked closer with like Secretary Clinton and Secretary Kerry. Um, and well, really one of my proudest moments was the work that both um, Secretary Clinton and Secretary Kerry uh, really put into trying to get this treaty move forward. And obviously President Obama, who as one of his first actions as president signed the treaty. Um, so, and then I think also, I, I really believe that the US very much is still a leader in not the past four years, um, but I think reemerging that disability is a part of uh, the work that uh, this president and his administration will be focusing on and elevating. Um, it, I think is really showing that diversity um, is something that they're focusing on and you can see it now slowly coming forward in documents that are coming out of agencies where disability is more typically included um, in the litany of groups that are being focused on. All of that I think is very important. Judy, I have one final question for you. This is probably the most important question. What are you gonna wear to the Oscars? <laughs> I have this really amazing outfit. Uh, I'm so excited. I am wearing clothing that's been designed by Mark Arian, NYC. One of the women that did a lot of the work, her name is Alexandra O'Neill. And uh, she also was one of the designer, designers for um, one of Dr. Biden's uh, clothes for the inauguration. And it's pants and a really nice jacket that's a crop jacket uh, with sequences and some other stones and has um, gold trim around the cuffs and the border of the jacket. And then a silk blouse, which is uh, like a champagne silk, um, which will go underneath. Oh. And my red amazing sandal from Milan. And I'm gonna be wearing a bracelet um, from Italy also, which um, has braille on it oh. and says, this is me. Oh. I don't know yet what earrings I'm gonna be wearing, okay. but I'm getting them in the mail today. So oh. I've never had anybody make clothing for me like this. So oh. it's really, it's really amazing. I'm very it's happy. Really, I'm so happy for you. I can't wait to watch, Judy. I cannot wait to watch. And I do hope they zoom in on those special sandals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you all very much. So we just wanted to show you some photos of Judy at the Oscars. And that's Jim Lebrecht, who was the producer of Crip Camp. And there's Judy's wonderful outfit that she talked about in her earrings from Milan. And um, we are so happy that Judy took the time 
to um, interview with us and talk with our students. I'll ask Joanna if she wants to come on now. And so before, before we go, um, um, I know I was really disappointed. A lot of people in the disability community was really disappointed that Crip Camp did not win an Oscar. And I thought that um, I, I read this article this morning uh, that I thought would be really appropriate to read here. And so um, this article is, uh, was posted on medium.com and the title is, the Oscars had the chance to make civil rights history and pass. Um, the disability rights movement remains relegated to the back of the bus. And this is an article by Rich Perlou. If you watched last night's broadcast very carefully, you may have noticed something unusual. At a table right in front of the stage were three attendants in wheelchairs. Had Crip Camp, a disability revolution won for best documentary feature, Jim Lebrecht would have been the first person in a wheelchair to win an Oscar. For the seminal film about the civil rights movement for people with disabilities, a fight for rights that continued for decades after laws were passed prohibiting discrimination based on race or sex, receiving an Oscar would have been the love wins moment for the disability rights movement. They gave it to the octopus. For most, naming a leader of the civil rights movement isn't hard. There are many familiar names, Dubois, Rosa Parks, Malcolm and Martin, Ida B. Wells, John Lewis, just to name a few. The same holds true for other civil rights movements, such as the women's movement, Sojourner Truth, Gloria Steinem, Susan B. Anthony, Latinx workers' rights, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, GLBTQ plus rights, Harvey Milk. Can you name a leader from the disability rights movement? Most of us couldn't. Sure, in elementary school, we all read that book by Helen Keller published in 1903, the story of my life. Since then, no idea. Enter Crip Camp. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed. Discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, and sex was made illegal. No such protections existed for people with disabilities. A qualified job candidate could be denied hire for having a disability. Kids were locked up in mess in institutions, later exposed as rife with abuse and starvation. Others living with families were incredibly isolated, unable to even attend the local public schools. Then some hippies in upstate New York decided to open a summer camp for kids with disabilities. This is the beginning of the story brought to life in this winner of the Audience Award at the Sundance Film Festival, written and directed by Nicole Newham and Jim Lebrecht. Jim's wife, producer Sarah Boulder, was also nominated. Summaries of the film can be found elsewhere. In short, it's a story about outsiders finding community for the first time in their lives. A group of marginalized people who realize the only way they will ever be treated fairly is by fighting for their rights. The leader of that fight was Jim's fellow camper, Judy Human. After she was denied her New York teacher's license, Judy sued and became the first wheelchair user to teach in New York City. She led the 504 sit-in of 1977, the longest ever to occur at a federal building. 
buckling to pressure under from the sit-in, U.S. Secretary of State, Health, uh, U.S. Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Joseph Califano, signed regulations which, for the first time, guaranteed civil rights for people with disabilities. Judy also helped launch the independent living movement, co-founded the World Institute on Disability, and served as the first advisor on disability in development for the World Bank. If you haven't heard of Judy Human or don't know the story of the disability rights movement, you aren't alone. It's not just the Oscars that have passed on the opportunity to recognize leaders of the disability rights movement, we place the names of leaders of other civil rights movements on our schools, our streets, and our currency. Not so for disability rights leaders. The story of the disability rights movement is seldom told. We certainly don't revere its heroes. Of course, Judy Human was not the only leader for the disability rights movement just as Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez were not the only leaders of their movements. Nor is the fight for civil rights for people with disabilities over. Employment discrimination for people with disabilities did not become illegal until 1990. People with disabilities currently compromise more than half of those living below the poverty line. Although many have the desire and capacity to work, only 18% of people with disabilities are employed. In one study, near identical cover letters were sent to prospective employers. The only difference was that some revealed that an applicant had a disability. The more experienced candidates who had disabilities were 34% less likely to be considered. Don't get me wrong, I liked the octopus movie. The part where she wraps her little tentacle around the guy's finger is very sweet. The love wins moment is yet to come for the disability rights movement. With Crip Camp available on Netflix to those who want to hear the story, the day is closer than ever, even if it wasn't last night or Sunday night. When the moment comes, you might recognize another person who was seated in a wheelchair at the foot of the Oscar stage. And that was Judy Human. So with our big disappointment that Crip Camp did not win an Oscar, I was very happy that um, Sound of Metal did walk away with a, a couple Oscars, so was happy about that. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Joanna to do our conclusion. Thank you. Um, so if you haven't already, uh, definitely check out uh, Crip Camp. It is available on Netflix. And also uh, check out Judy Human's books. Being Human and Rolling Warrior. Uh, so please join us for our last speaker series next Tuesday, May 4th at 8 a.m. Central Standard Time, uh, which will be a conversation about autism uh, with Tracy Thresher and Larry Bissonette. And uh, in, pre in preparation for this session, uh, you may wanna watch the documentary, Wretches and Jabberers. So this yeah. wraps up our session today. Yeah, and actually we're gonna do a special showing of the documentary, documentary, Retchers and Jabbers on Monday at 7 p.m. So if you hop on this um, same link uh, that you normally do on Tuesday mornings at seven o'clock on Monday, next Monday, right before we have Larry and Tracy with us, um, we will be live streaming um, retchers and, and, and jabbers. So join us. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good
Thank you for watching the Rehabilitation Studies Speaker Series.